My name is Sven Shackleton and I'm the author of this recent paper, Should We Mind the Gap? What I want to talk about very briefly is the gender pay gap. There are many problems with pay and people's concern about pay in this country. People worry about difference between particular ethnic groups, between uh, high paid city traders and poorly paid public sector workers and so forth. But probably the gap that concerns most people, because we're all involved in it, is the gap in average pay between men and women, the gender pay gap. Currently that stands at around 17% uh, if we consider um, hourly earnings of full-time male and female workers, a gap of about 17%. That compares um, with the European average, it's around the European average, but there are some countries which have a much lower pay gap. For example, Italy, which is about half the uh, pay gap which we have in the UK. However, we shouldn't read very much into these differences because one of the things about Italy is that it has a, a relatively small proportion of women who are employed full time. And uh, that is one of the factors which uh, influences the size of this, this statistical measure, the pay gap. On other indicators, for example, uh, the Eurobarometer's measure of uh, perceived sex discrimination, Italy comes out as the worst in Europe. So that gives us a message immediately that the pay gap is not necessarily the same thing as sex discrimination. A lot of people feel that the government should do more about the pay gap, but in order to do so, you have to understand how this pay gap is made up. It does not result from men and women doing the same jobs being paid unequally. There has been the Equal Pay Act since 1970 to prevent this. What it does result from is men and women doing really rather different jobs. And as a consequence, uh, gaps arise in the average rates of pay. Now, why do men and women do different jobs? Well, partly this is because of the uh, ed education experience uh, which they have. And there is evidence that the gap between men and women in this respect is narrowing. But a very large proportion of it is concerned with different preferences amongst men and women for, for different attributes of jobs. Uh, for example, women are much more attracted to jobs in the public sector, particularly to those related to caring professions and to dealing with people. Men are more prepared to work in market situations where, in the nature of things, uh, the, the, the rewards turn out to be rather different from those in the public sector. So different types of jobs and also different attitudes to work. Uh, women tend to take more time off work for various reasons. Uh, men uh, prefer to change jobs more frequently uh, in relation to, to trying to get an increase in pay, uh, whereas women change for, for more social reasons and to do with family circumstances. Men are much more likely, too, to try to negotiate their pay in any discussions rather than simply accept what they're offered first time round. Now, these differences may seem to be trivial, but over a lifetime, uh, this tends to pan out into significant differences in average earnings. The question is, of course, what can the government do about this? One of the measures which has been suggested is compulsory pay audits. Now, these operate in the public sector, and the idea is that they should be extended to the private sector. But it has to be said that the uh, evidence of, 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 of the, the use of uh, of audit schemes and the related job evaluation schemes has not been a really satisfactory one. It's been extremely expensive in the public sector and the evidence is that it's not making all that much difference uh, to the average gender pay gap over time. Pay audit schemes uh, are used in the public sector under the gender equality duty which goes back two or three years uh, in order to try to find ways in which you can compare the, different, the very different jobs which men and women do. Uh, for example, in the public sector, less than 3% of firefighters are women, uh, whereas over 80% of social workers are women. If you look at primary schools, something like 85% of primary school teachers are female, but there are only about a third of university teachers who are female. So if you've got men and women doing really rather different jobs, the question is, can you compare them in some way? And what typically this involves is having a job evaluation scheme where various attributes of jobs are listed and compared, and points are given, which then enable uh, people to make um, auditors to make comparisons between, say, the job of somebody who works on the bins and somebody who works as an office cleaner. This is then used for a determination of pay. 
This has been uh, a, a matter of serious controversy within the public sector. The single status agreement, for example, for local authority workers has led to an enormous number of equal pay and sex discrimination claims, largely because unions have tried to prevent uh, male workers from, being, from having their pay reduced as a result of these types of uh, job evaluations. It's also been very costly in terms of uh, to the taxpayer. Uh, in the last year, for example, um, around half a billion pounds had to be uh, subvented by central government to local authority to help them with these kind of concerns. The idea is that, uh, that, that this ought over time to lead to uh, jobs being treated equally uh, in the public sector and paid in a fair way. When these things are carried out, there does tend to be some reduction in the gender pay gap, but this may only be a temporary arrangement, because what happens when you have uh, an imposed pay structure uh, of the kind which these orders provide? is that you get uh, shortages of people whose pay has been reduced, or of jobs where pay, pay has been reduced, and you have excess supply of people wanting to come into areas where pay has been increased. And so over time, you have to find ways in which you can adjust to this. If there is a shortage of workers at the officially declared rate, then what you tend to have is golden lows, you have resettlement arrangements, you have bonuses and things like this, which tend to boost pay back up again. So the evidence that is that in the longer term, these types of schemes don't have any very great impact on the overall uh, gender pay gap. A final point I'd like to raise, and this is treated in, in, uh, in the book, is that the gender pay gap is only one of a number of pay gaps which we could try to analyse. We know that there are very significant and indeed much larger pay gaps between different ethnic groups within the population. Uh, amongst male workers, for example, the most highly paid group are not white males but are in fact Indians, a large proportion of whom are in, um, in, in middle class professional occupations such as doctors. Um, there are also very considerable variations um, in terms of the relationship between men and women's pay within these groupings. For example, on average, black Caribbean women earn more than black Caribbean men. Bangladeshi women earn more than Bangladeshi men. And incidentally, uh, one of the reasons for this is, is that very few Bangladeshi women work. Those who do are highly educated and work in good jobs whereas uh, something like a third of all Bangladeshi men actually work in so-called Indian restaurants. In addition to these ethnic pay gaps, there are also gaps in relation to uh, things like disability. Workers with a disability tend to earn significantly less than those with a, uh, who, who are able-bodied, other things being equal. Uh, a third area of increasing importance and significance is sexual orientation. I think it's not well known that there is a pay gap in favour of gay and lesbian people. Gay males earn more than heterosexual males on average. Lesbian women earn more on average than heterosexual women. Again, this is not because there is some kind of strange discrimination in their favour. It's because they do different types of jobs and they have different types of career structures. And this is a final point I want to leave you with. When we talk about a gender pay gap, we're making awful assumptions, really, about the way in which men's uh, experience is very similar and women, women's experience is different but very similar. In fact, within these broad groupings, there are huge variations of lifestyle, interests, professions, occupations, and so forth, which mean that these kind of very crude comparisons between male and female pay are really extremely misleading and therefore, in my view, a very bad guide to public policy.